Welcome everybody to this very special collaborative meetup between the Australasia Preserves Community of Practice and the National and State Libraries Australasia Digital Preservation Network. I am Jay Weatherburn. I'm the Program Manager of Digital Preservation at the University of Melbourne. And today I'm representing the Australasia Preserves Co-Organizers Group. I would like to uh, firstly acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I am joining the meeting from today the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay respect to their elders past and present, and also extend that respect to traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and from all lands where people are joining us from today. Australasia Preserves is a digital preservation community of practice for anybody who's new here today. It's for Australia, New Zealand and the broader Australasian region. Our community activities cover a lot of varied interests and different areas of working with digitized and born digital materials, encouraging participation and input from a really wide variety of people and organizations. So, you know, it includes, but it's not limited to libraries and archives and records and IT and government and universities. And I could go on, lots of different people and folks joining us. The community was formed in February 2018, following the success of an inaugural meeting at the University of Melbourne in Australia. And this meeting was organized by the University of Melbourne Scholarly Services Digital Stewardship Research Team. So as mentioned, I am one of the co-organizers of this community alongside some faces you'll see here today. Everyone give a wave, Matthew Burgess, Rachel Trapia, Leanne Raymond, Andrea Gothals, Martin Gengenbach, and Jesse Dyer, with support from Robin Wright, who is the head of DPC, Australasia and Asia Pacific. And I have to call out special support from my University of Melbourne colleagues today, Ailey Smith and Lyle Winton as well. This volunteer co-organizers group, we do a lot of stuff. We organize these meetups, we write blog posts, we keep the online forum going. We've set up and maintained the website for Australasia Preserves and all of the resources that this community has developed and shared over the last four years. If you would like to get involved with us, we welcome volunteers anytime. Uh, please do get in touch with any of us. A quick note to update your bookmarks for getting to that website for Australasia Preserves. We're going through a slow change process with the URL at the moment and hopefully before too long, folks will all know this new link to get to all of those great resources. It is my very great pleasure now to throw over to Matthew Burgess as co-host for today. Thanks, Jay. Uh, as the network lead for NASLA's Digital Preservation Network, I'm excited to co-host today's event with Jay. I'm coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So National and State Libraries Australasia is the peak body for national, state and territory libraries of Australia and New Zealand. And the Digital Preservation Network aims to share knowledge and expertise to increase the professional capability of staff. So with an overlap in interest from both groups on today's topic of discussion, we thought it would be a great opportunity to collaborate and broaden the discussion across sectors. I'd now like to pass over to Marty. Kia ora everyone. Uh, I'd like to present an acknowledgement on behalf of New Zealand. Zealand. Uh, I can make my slides work. Sia koto na monga na awa na waka na tupuna o ataroa mete fenua moe moea e hui hui mai nei tena koto katoa. To you, the mountains, rivers, waka, ancestors of Etaroa and the land of the dreaming that are gathered here, greetings to you all. Acknowledging these things acknowledges all the lands that we come from, the travels and the people who have brought us here. It also acknowledges that each of us carries these things with us and that they impact upon our gathering. And I will throw back to Matt. Actually me, I'll take oh, over. Oh, excuse there. me, Jay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I, I have the job of the boring housekeeping today. I will save Matt from it. Um, I need to say that this presentation is being recorded today just the presentation parts. So we never record any of the discussion parts and it does go onto the Australasia Preserves YouTube channel after the event. We have a code of conduct for the community. Australasia Preserves is a very diverse community, as I mentioned, from a very wide range of social and cultural and professional backgrounds. 
So we do ask that everyone brings a spirit of respect and friendly inquiry to all of our interactions. Uh, the code of conduct, there is a link in the chat. Um, we encourage everyone to be familiar with this, have a skim of it, um, be familiar with this lovely community that we're attempting to build here. Please give yourself an identifiable name in this Zoom platform. Uh, if you can't work out how to do that, please yell out in the chat box and someone will be able to help you do that. And speaking of the chat function, this is yours to use. Say hello, introduce yourself, call out if there's any tech issues as we go, ask questions as we go. And Leanne will be wrangling that for us today. And Jesse's gonna help us run the Q&A at the end of the presentations. So let's get into it. This meetup, we are focusing on the topic of digital preservation frameworks, strategies, and policies. We've broken up our time today into two separate parts. So for the first hour, we have three presentations from speakers who are developing, implementing, and reviewing their digital preservation strategies and policies and frameworks. We'll follow all of the speakers with a short Q&A. And following this, we'll take a really short break and then we're gonna come back to the second half where we will organize some breakout room discussions. So smaller room discussions for people to actively engage, share and learn from each other on different approaches to digital preservation strategy and policy work. So introducing first up, Matthew Burgess. In this presentation, Matt will discuss the development of a digital preservation framework within the policy landscape of the library State Library New South Wales, that is, and how this aims to provide a mechanism to monitor and assess the library's digital preservation maturity, capability, and infrastructure to prioritize related activities and resources. So over to you, Matt. Thanks, Jay, and hopefully my slides are working and everyone can see that. Uh, let me just sort out my screens. Okay, so thanks for the introduction, Jay. Um, so I'm Matthew Burgess, the lead digital archivist at the State Library of New South Wales. I manage the digital curation team uh, working with Bond Digital Collections, and I also chair the library's digital preservation and access development group. So today I'm going to discuss the process of developing a new digital preservation framework within the context of the State Library of New South Wales. The framework is now available online at the following URL, which one of my colleagues will hopefully post into the chat. The digital preservation framework outlines the intent and technical principles for activities undertaken as part of the library's strategy for digital preservation for all digital collections. It is a key instrument for internal advocacy through the endorsement and approval process, providing a mechanism to highlight achievements, areas that require further development and to put practice into writing. So it's important to understand the strategy and policy landscape at the library and where the framework fits in. The library's strategic plan outlines our mission and sets out key initiatives, including the grounding priorities to collect, preserve and provide access. The library has had a digital preservation policy in place since 2015, and the physical and digital preservation policies were combined in 2021 as a single collection preservation policy. This outlines high level principles that will enable us to prolong the life of all collection materials so they can be used for research and, the enjo and enjoyment for as long as possible. I was not part of the process to combine the preservation policies, stepping into my current role as it was approved, but for me it highlighted the need for a document focusing on digital preservation that could go into more detail than a policy or strategy level document. So the digital preservation framework was developed as a technical outline of the managed activities the library will use to ensure continued access to digital collections. It documents processes that evolved, have evolved over the past six years and provides a mechanism for monitoring these processes, our progress and achievements in digital preservation. So the framework aligns with the library's strategic plan and provides a plan of action over a set period, while the collection preservation policy outlines the principles that underpin this work. The framework is approved, endorsed and operated by separate stakeholder groups with the following reporting structure. So the Integrated Library System Strategy Group drives direction and associated business decisions to ensure the integrated collection management systems deliver strategic outcomes for the library and its readers. Its membership includes executive and manager level roles across multiple divisions and work areas of the library. 
Without a dedicated team and a distributed model for digital preservation at the library, the Digital Preservation and Access Development Group brings together stakeholders from across the organization. Its membership includes team leaders and other stakeholders in roles that can make decisions and affect change in their areas of work. So DPADG reports to ILSSG. The Digital Collections Operations Working Group was established for more technical of discussions to manage operational activities with staff across multiple branches working with multiple systems reports to DPADG. So the framework is approved by ILSSG, endorsed by DPADG and operated by DigiCops. We love our acronyms. So DPADG is a key stakeholder and consultation, sorry, consultation mechanism for any digital preservation related projects and activities at the library and was an important avenue for the development and review of the framework. The group provides governance over day-to-day -day digital preservation activities for both digitized and born digital material, including creation, acquisition, storage, preservation planning, preservation actions, management, access, metadata, and documentation. The development timeline for the framework was relatively straightforward. I created the first draft of the framework based on a review of internal documents, a review of policy strategies and frameworks from other organizations and with reference to the Digital Preservation Coalition's policy toolkit and the capabilities outlined in the DPC rapid assessment model. The first draft was circulated for internal review to each stakeholder group with three draft versions going through this internal review process. The library is a full member of the Digital Preservation Coalition through National and State Libraries Australasia, so we were of the member benefit for dedicated support to review the framework. This external review resulted in the most and was a vital step in the development of the framework. It was helpful receiving feedback from those external to the library to clarify where more detail is required, to amend or remove statements, to remove any ambiguity or misunderstanding of intention, and to add sections that were omitted. Each version of the document included a history outlining what changes were made and following the external review, version one of the framework was taken to DPADG for endorsement and ILSSG for approval. So it was approved with some minor amendments and was published on the library's website last week. Overall, most of the time was taken up by the review process. So the first draft was written in January and circulated in February with the final version approved in May this year. The framework applies to all digital collections managed within the library's digital preservation system and excludes those managed by vendors or other organizations such as national e-deposit or e-resources. All staff working with digital collections are responsible for understanding and adhering to the framework and related operational procedures and documentation. The framework covers the following areas and I'm not going to go into them all in detail now, but we'll quickly highlight a few sections. As I mentioned, distributed responsibility for digital preservation at the library with a strong focus on collaboration across teams, branches, and so developing the framework provided the opportunity to define responsibilities as they sit within our current organizational structure and as they have developed since the library implemented our digital preservation system in 2016. So this process prompted discussions on resourcing, highlighting teams and branches our, collect our digital collections impact. Described under the continuous improvement section, the DPC RAM is the foundation of the framework. So the model has thorough documentation and tools for implementation and is easy to use and distribute. The worksheet was used to detail why we are at the current levels and what we aim to achieve in the next two years to reach the target levels. The worksheet was included as part of the review process where feedback and discussion resulted in changing some of the levels. In future, I will include a comparison of the library's levels with those from DPC members as part of the internal review process. The published version of the framework only contains a graph with current and target levels. Engagement with communities of practice and collaboration with other organizations is critical for sharing knowledge and expertise and working on standards and good practice across diverse sectors. This is something I include in role descriptions and it was important to include it as part of the framework. The library is involved in several initiatives, including the Digital Preservation Coalition, Australasia Preserves, and the NASLA Digital Preservation Network. Sharing the framework in this context was inspired by those who have done so already. So I encourage everyone to publish and share your documentation where you can. 
The framework must be reviewed on a regular basis to ensure that it is aligned with good practice and the collection preservation policy and the library's strategic plan. It will be reviewed every two years and will include the completion of the DPC RAM, which provides an opportunity to benchmark and reflect on any changes to the levels. It will be interesting to see how this review process goes for the first time, whether the goals were achieved or if they were even realistic to begin with within the review period, and whether there is a need to include any other assessment tools as part of the review, such as the NDSA levels of preservation. The framework includes a section on staff skills and on staff skills and training, which indicates our aim to conduct periodic staff skills audit. So we'll be looking at the DPC competency audit toolkit as part of this process process, which may form part of the review of the next version of the framework, or be documented as an activity as part of the digital preservation and access development group during the current framework period. So now that the framework is complete and published, next steps involve undertaking work to achieve some of the aims it outlines. This includes improving documentation of activities and processes for a consistent approach across teams, development of a recommended file format statement to guide acquisition and preservation decisions and processes, and starting to focus on preservation planning and activities within our digital preservation system. This also includes improving knowledge and process documentation across teams working with digital collections. So thank you, that was a pretty quick run through. Um, hopefully my screen has stopped sharing. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Jay as the next speaker. Uh, so Jay Weatherburn is the Program Manager of Digital Preservation at the University of Melbourne and will share some of the iterative and opportunity focused approaches taken to implement a university-wide strategy for digital preservation and the outcomes to date. Over to you, Jay. Thanks, Matt. That was really great to hear about that process you went through. I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach. I'm going to focus on two things in this very short amount of time. Firstly, strategy implementation, and secondly, an emerging policy approach for digital preservation at the University of Melbourne. So firstly, the strategy. This is the foundation that guides all of our implementation work that we're doing. There's a few key things that I wanna highlight that we've experienced with having a strategy for digital preservation that may be helpful for others. Uh, firstly, defining a really clear scope in a strategy for digital preservation work is really beneficial. So in this case, a university-wide scope is detailed across research outputs, university records, research data, and cultural collections of the university. Having a really clear definition of scope has enabled clearer decision-making and also greatly aids with prioritization at various points when you're thinking about implementing digital preservation. Endorsement is helpful. This strategy was endorsed for the university context by academic board. So it had this essential high level oversight and the visibility that it needed to get started to then gain traction and then to maintain momentum. And it's a really huge milestone in itself just to get a strategy written, especially when it's being done collaboratively. The next challenge is finding resourcing to implement it. So in this example, a lot of time and energy was also spent on a business case in the first instance to fund various project resourcing activities to get this thing started. This included a full-time project funded staff member to really own and ensure that dedicated work began on the strategy implementation. The vision of the strategy states that by 2025, the university will have a robust culture that enables a widely held and coherent understanding of digital preservation. It will have infrastructure that supports the establishment of logical and operational workflows for dealing with digital materials. In the policy space, consolidation and institution-wide awareness of policies, strategies, et cetera, that underpin the need for digital preservation. And for the organization, the establishment of a fully configured digital archiving service. So in terms of these grand strategy vision statements and being able to turn those into practical, tangible realities in a large and complex organization, at a high level, I thought I could share what each of these strategy areas are starting to look like, keeping in mind this is now almost seven years 
that we've been implementing this strategy now, seven years in. So for the cultural change vision, we prioritized a lot of staff time and energy into advocacy and communication work, skills development activities and community building and partnerships, as Matt mentioned, not just to support you know, the internal work that we're doing, but to connect and support the broader community of very diverse organizations. I mean, we're all grappling with the realities of digital preservation. So, you know, activities like this rich resource that is the Australasia Preserves community and the partnership that the university has built with the Digital Preservation Coalition internationally, these activities have been supported by the culture vision of this strategy. For infrastructure development and that grand statement, the establishment of logical and operational workflows, the university-wide approach that the strategy implies has led to us being able to make decisions about what technical infrastructure is best suited to the university environment. So in our context, an enterprise technology system was determined to be the fit for purpose solution at the time through multiple workshops and a very robust university procurement process. There's a clear direction in the strategy that the technical foundation needs to be one that most broadly supports digital assets in those multiple domains across the university. We started with uh, information management expertise in three foundational business unit areas. These are being the library, the archives and the records teams at the university. Focusing on these three foundational areas has really helped to grow our internal coalition of the willing and able, as we call it, for digital preservation work. This also grows capacity internally so that no one person is alone doing digital preservation work anymore. Um, technology implementation work has enabled us to also build really essential relationships with our IT teams. Um, digital preservation involves so much relationship building and this in itself has directly supported the culture vision in a roundabout way by getting digital preservation awareness and agendas into bigger conversations across the organization, including consideration of digital preservation when IT roadmaps, for example, are being either developed or updated. Digital preservation is then part of the conversation. For the policy goal, in those very early days of strategy implementation back in 2016, 2017, we did a lot of analysis and review work, including a review of university policies that had some relevance or some touch points for digital preservation work. And then in later years, in conjunction with our technology implementation and all those decisions about the system, we've been able to now focus in on developing a policy approach for this emerging digital preservation repository that we're building. This is what we call our digital preservation framework, another use for the word framework. This for us includes guidance for development of ongoing procedures and processes for digital preservation. Also building an internal wiki for digital preservation with all of our emerging operations information, that kind of thing. For organization, shifting from smaller pilots and projects that have trialed digital preservation approaches to a more programmatic approach is now happening around six or seven years after beginning implementing a strategy. This includes dedicated time to doing those uh, regular maturity modeling exercises, uh, like Matt mentioned, and prioritizing various elements for that continuous improvement. It also includes uh, new relationship building, always, always, and future business case and project planning to integrate new areas of the university into the emerging digital preservation ecosystem, you know, such as we need to tackle research data preservation next and how digital preservation intersects with cultural collections and digital asset management at the university, as well as the big question, investigating how a digital archiving service can evolve at the university. So in summary regarding strategies, I find having an endorsed strategy to work towards that has a structure and that very clear scope about organizational context is extremely useful because it helps you along the way check your prioritizing 
and the you know the directions that you may be deciding to take as you put digital preservation in place. I'm now going to very quickly focus in on our framework, which is how digital preservation policy is emerging at the university. In the university context, whereas the 10-year strategy we just looked at talks about the grand high-level vision and principles, the framework is an operationally built policy for the actual doing of digital preservation work. Uh, we call it a framework because at this stage of its development, it is a policy that is operationally built, like from the ground up rather than a top-down approach to policy. And as such, it really is, um, it's a foundational precursor to any officially developed and endorsed digital preservation policy for the university in the future. We actively developed the framework from its initial draft status at the same time as implementing the technology. In hindsight, this was a lot of work all at once, but it ended up being really useful as we were able to document and make decisions about uh, various fit for purpose policy decisions. And that really enabled the infrastructure then to be set up to function realistically, and we hope sustainably. So, so far we've developed a clear purpose, mandate, scope, and objectives for a digital preservation repository, the operating principles of such a repository, and that all important emerging roles and responsibilities for making our new operations consistent and also understood by the different teams who are contributing to it. So in the distributed team environment at the university, as an example, with separate library, separate archives, records, and IT teams, no one of these areas is going to have all of the skills or all of the answers for digital preservation implementation. All of us kind of need to do some part of the work, right, that goes into long-term preservation. So the principle of this ground up policy development we're trying really is, you know, we should all own the development of how we do this, um, how it evolves. So included in the development of this framework were operational staff actively contributing to digital preservation activities, as well as senior management and leadership from different teams for reviewing various iterations. And we found at this point of the process developing this policy approach from that very realistic operational perspective has enabled us to put in place some emerging operations for digital preservation and potentially it provides it provides a starting point really to be able to scale to a university-wide policy perspective, hopefully over time. The key thing being, we want it to be realistically achievable instead of being a very aspirational policy with no touch points to the actual on the ground operations. So to finish up, I'm aware I'm gonna get the ping soon. So here is more detail of exactly what is in the framework in its current version four as of February this year. To highlight just a few things, uh, all the top here, background, objectives, audience, scope, authority. These just really help us to focus the content and the scope of the framework appropriately. These are the meaty bits, the framework principles, the operating procedures and the roles and responsibilities. These focus on the university's very new digital preservation repository and the operations that are being put in place to support it. Definitions ah, help to avoid any confusion or those little arguments you have about what various terms mean in this context. The framework approver and steward and the review frequency, the version history, just very good information management principles, measures put in place there. And finally, appendix one to three, um, particularly of note here are references. These are published policies and other resources I found that were really helpful to consult when developing the framework. There's a bunch of them out there. There is a lot of policy um, help and resources in the digital preservation world for anyone embarking on this work. And finally, uh, Appendix 3. This covers a history of digital preservation work at the university from the years 2014 to now. For now, we think this is a good place to keep this comprehensive history. You know, we so often don't document the how and the why of decisions and pathways taken, you know, especially when you consider how much can change at an organization over a 10 year strategy implementation period. So what we do is we try to keep a record of this for both ourselves and our future selves who take on the work that we're putting in now.
putting in place now. That's me. Thank you, everyone. I hope that was useful or interesting. I'm going to introduce and throw directly over to Martin Gengenbach from the National Library of New Zealand. In this presentation, um, Martin Gengenbach, Digital Preservation Policy and Outreach Specialist from the National Library of New Zealand, will outline recent efforts to update the National Library's Digital Preservation Policy Manual and related activities to expand policy documentation across the library. So over to you, Marty. Thank you, Jay. And I'm just gonna share my screen so that everyone can see slides. All right, I think we are in the right place. Um, so as Jay introduced, my name is Marty Gengenbach and I'm here to talk about uh, reviving a long dormant digital preservation policy. So in April of this year, I started working at the National Library of New Zealand as digital preservation policy and outreach specialist. So um, I'm particularly uh, grateful for the timing of this event. Um, it's been really useful for me uh, as a way to think back over what I've been doing for the first few, mo few months in this role and hopefully to conceptualize uh, some of my efforts into something that can be useful for others. Um, this sleepy little guy is not me. Uh, throughout this talk, I've included some images from the Alexander Turnbull Library's digitized collections, and references are included at the end of this presentation. For anyone not familiar with the long history of digital preservation work at NLNZ, uh, the National Library has been globally recognized for its contributions to digital preservation, including work on the uh, digital preservation metadata that preceded premise, co-development of the Rosetta Digital Preservation System, which has been implemented here at the library as the National Digital Heritage Archive. Um, the library has also been an early and active collector of New Zealand's online heritage. Um, web collecting activities date back to 1999, and uh, we completed our first whole of NZ domain uh, collection in 2008 and have uh, proceeded to do that on an almost annual basis since. Um, in addition to these technical achievements, the library has been active in the realm of policy and strategy for digital preservation. So they re released their first digital preservation strategy in 2008, a joint preservation strategy with Archives New Zealand, with, uh, with whom they share a repository in 2011, and a joint policy manual in 2012 um, that while never finished did provide a structure and outline for future policy development. This has all led to nearly a decade of successful operations, um, marked with continuing growth in the digital preservation program and its uh, and users it serves. The NDHA currently holds 43.8 million files spanning 246 different formats and consists of 530 terabytes of data. Um, this history of digital preservation at the library is a success story. Uh, this is a program that has demonstrated utility and trustworthiness and seen massive growth both in users and in operational support. During this time, the program experienced the sorts of things that all other organizations do. Staff turnover, organizational change and restructuring, and the growth in scope that comes with any transition from a focused project to an operational program. So the good intentions, excuse me, of the uh, of the team to maintain a regular process of policy review and update fell victim to the everyday operational needs of the program. And this brings us to the interactive component of this presentation, where uh, if this sounds familiar to you, um, then send some love in the chat, because I know that I've seen this in many organizations in the past. So this brings us to the current state of the digital preservation policy and digital preservation at the library. Um, I've identified three kinds of general issues with policy as it exists um, at, at the library. Um, first off, it does not reflect current practice. Second, the manual itself has significant gaps that limits a, it the, that limit its ability to guide operational work, excuse me. And third, um, policies are out of step with technology and can actually hinder the efficient completion of some operational work. And this all presents risk 
there's a risk that users and collaborators don't have accurate information on how to engage with us. There's a risk that administrators don't have a clear understanding of our operations from which to make strategic decisions. And there's a risk that we cannot advocate for ourselves uh, because we can't point to policy to back up our requirements. And I will go into each of these in a little bit more detail in the following slides. Um, the overall structure of the current policy manual doesn't reflect practices uh, in the organization. As I mentioned, the manual provides a pathway for future policy development. However, in the case of this technical committee, as an example, um, many of the organizational structures that are involved in that pathway for policy development don't actually exist. Um, so these interactions in reality are happening in a much more dynamic and collaborative way. Um, the team has streamlined a lot, many of their activities to keep up with the pace of operational work and uh, the nature of the organizational changes that have taken place. So the policy manual is written for an organizational context and structure that no longer applies. Uh, so it doesn't really align with any of the lived experiences of the team members. Uh, the second thing that we that I've noticed in, in reviewing policy here is gaps in digital preservation policy. So these are operational areas where we should be making digital preservation commitments, but we aren't. Um, one example of this is our policy around web archiving. Uh, there have been lots of policies developed and published within the library, but they are primarily focused on what to collect. And this reflects the growth in the web archiving programs um, as an extension of existing collecting activities. So the lack of clear preservation guidance um, means that many other decisions about web archiving, such as how online collecting occurs, how exceptions are handled, how access is provisioned, are not made and documented consistently. Um, we are really lucky in that we have an amazingly talented and experienced team and teams doing this work. Um, but there's a risk with this that, that their institutional knowledge and expertise could be lost if any of these wonderful people decide to take another job. Uh, further, it's difficult for both the public and internal staff to clearly understand what web archiving activities are happening and how those materials are being preserved by the, uh, by the library and how best to make use of those collections. Finally, there are places where the policy as it stands is actually an impediment to successful operation. Uh, our digital preservation policy states that we conduct a systematic fixity check on every object once per year. Um, because of our technical constraints in our current environment, we can't do this as an automated background operation, which was the assumption behind the policy when it was first created. So we must manually execute and shepherd a process that draws content down from our storage in order to validate stored fixity information. So this is a case where we know that our process is something we can improve upon from a technical perspective. However, first we need to update the policy to give us the flexibility to achieve those desired outcomes. And this is where I come in. Uh, so I was hired into this role, as I said, and started in April of this year. So I'm still very new to this role. But one of the things that I see is really key to my success here is uh, viewing these two pieces, policy and outreach, as closely related. To create good policy, I need to understand the digital preservation work that is being done across the library. And to understand the scope of that work, I have to talk to the people who are doing it. And that means outreach and advocacy and relationship building, not just in the library itself, but also in related business units, such as our uh, collaboration with the Archives New Zealand and with the um, larger DIA Department of Interior in which we're situated. Um, also regional uh, gl and global digital preservation community groups, such as this one. So um, again, very happy to be here. So these are all the relationships that are necessary. Um, to know and understand what each different group's priorities are, um, because that is the best way to get these things done is to be able to align work, my work to support those priorities. So this ensures that digital preservation policies remain relevant and useful to the people that they are being written to um, commit. 
And that is a pretty good summary of everything that I've been doing since April. I've been learning about the overall organization and its uh, priorities, building relationships with the teams that are working in digital preservation and pre preservation adjacent spaces. And of course, reviewing documentation to understand what we have and have not yet put into writing. Uh, at this stage, my goal is to provide policy-based support where it's most impactful, finding the places where I can make a difference right now. Um, the three examples that I discussed earlier in the overall preservation policy document structure um, in fixity and integrity policies and in the preservation of web archives content, these are all areas that I'm supporting right now. Um, and success in these areas I see as integral to success down the road uh, when it comes to my longer term goals, which are at this point um, more of a, a series of uh, states than, than a set of objectives. So um, I'm putting together a picture of how I want pres uh, digital preservation policy revision and development uh, how I want that to look, but I'm still piecing together the steps that are going to get me there. Um, but a few things that will tell me I'm succeeding are, um, first off, if the policy is useful, does it get used? Does it get read? Does it answer common or frequent questions? And does it provide guidance and clarity in decision making? Uh, these are things that can demonstrate successful policy. Uh, I also want to know that I want business owners to know, excuse me, that there's a clear, coherent process that delivers this policy, um, and that process should be transparent and well documented itself. Uh, third, policy should be considered part of the development of new work streams, not as another box to check, but as genuinely useful source for guidance uh, to make sure that new processes are aligned with existing policy and or if any new policy is needed in order to support that, that we are talking, having that conversation. Um, the policy review process should be flexible. It can be initiated by business owners because they are closest to the work and uh, can identify the need. Um, it should also be uh, initiated by me as somebody who is learning from many contexts, who is bringing in uh, new and outside information from the digital preservation community. Also, uh, as, as Matt mentioned in his talk earlier, I love the idea of policy review being tied to programmatic assessment, uh, such as through DPC RAM and or the levels of digital preservation, where um, I, I think that's just a really cool idea. <laughs> um, a few things that I've learned along the way. Um, first is that stakeholders are not fixed over time. So much of my outreach has been around trying to identify what, uh, whether our digital preservation world uh, has expanded or contracted and who our current stakeholders and, and partners are. Um, it's important in that to find the right balance of collaboration in a large organization like ours. Um, I don't want to slow down, but I, and I don't want to slow anyone else down, but I also want to make sure that our policies have a high level of investment from the people who are uh, conducting the operational work. Um, I'm also trying to make sure that the changes I propose for digital preservation policy match to the desired outcomes of the business units. So uh, as a new person in particular, it's easy to look around and think it's time to change all the things. Um, but it's important to identify the outcome that you seek and determine if changing policy is really necessary. Um, if the proposed policy change doesn't uh, update to reflect the existing process, or it doesn't result in some sort of an operational shift, um, then there's a question of whether that policy is, it, change is actually necessary. And you wanna make sure the policy matches the desired outcomes. Um, and finally, while my initial scope of work has been very much focused on impact, um, it's important to separate the immediate needs from the bigger picture. Um, this is also a way of balancing between documentation and advocating for change. I'm not yet trying to come in and up yet upend everything. Most of what we're doing is trying to understand the context and make sure processes are adequately documented. And if in documenting that process, the business owners decide that they want to change something, then I'm happy to move that conversation forward. Um, so I have a long and growing list of opportunities that have been identified by business owners that will eventually become part of a longer term planning document. 
And finally, I'll just end with a note about uh, demystifying digital preservation policy. Uh, undertaking any type of policy revision or development can be a daunting task. Um, I can't remember where this mantra came from, but I, I really appreciate it. Um, policy is saying what you do and doing what you say. Um, that means clearly documenting processes and the decision making behind those processes and consistently executing those processes in operational work. So whether you're developing a new digital preservation policy or trying to re resurrect one that has gone dormant, um, it's not magic. It's relationship building, it's uh, collaboration, and it's documentation. Thank you very much.